Hello and thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast recorded for May 26th, 2020. How's everybody doing today? I wanted to talk today about some stuff that I've been doing this last week. For the last few weeks I've been talking about some outdoor stuff and some things kind of related to the the lockdown, pandemic stuff, but I might kind of change uh, change what I was talking about a little bit for this podcast. What I wanted to get into was uh, some of the training stuff I've been looking into around Logic Pro 10.5 that has uh, just come out recently, and I thought it'd be kind of uh, kind of cool to go over a little bit of an overview of some of the new features and stuff that are there, and, and some of the stuff that you can do with uh, a digital audio workstation, and uh, and why why I'd bother talking about it. But I think it was about about a year ago or so. I was talking about setting up this studio in the house that I'm at here and how I was getting a, a PC computer ready to go. It was an older one. It was, I think, like a, I don't know, something from some desktop I had around from, from 2010 or 11 or so. Yeah. Yeah, about that time. And I remember um, getting that computer set up with, a, I think it was, yeah, it had like Windows 10 on it. And then I was using, I think, the same audio interface. USB out into the computer, and then I had downloaded, um, I had downloaded Sonar, the new version of Sonar that you can get for free. I think it had been owned by what well, was Cakewalk Sonar, and then I think Gibson had bought out Cakewalk, and so it became Gibson Sonar. And then I think Gibson decided that wasn't going to be part of their business anymore, and so I think they just kind of shut it down, essentially. But then sold that off to Band Lab. And BandLab is a, I think, a, well, I don't know, it's another internet company. They have kind of a simplified digital audio workstation app that you can use uh, to kind of create a demo or something like that. But what they had done is they'd, they'd gone through, I guess, and had purchased probably for a relatively inexpensive price, I, or I don't know, I assume, since they're just uh, they're just keeping it and kind of hardly maintaining it or you know, doing a bit to maintain it. Uh, but they took the, the Sonar Platinum program, the full digital audio workstation uh, multi-tracking tool and they made it free for people to use and for people to get uh, but I think it's only a, a Windows only program so you gotta have uh, you gotta have Windows 10 to uh, to run it so I did that yeah and uh, and sonar was a program that I had worked with before uh, for doing some some studio multi-tracking stuff I think years ago probably around like 2012 2013 when I was uh, when I was working with some friends to set up uh, some studio equipment stuff it was cool. We had like a big uh, Soundcraft ghost that was laid out, and then we had a bunch of uh, a bunch of channels kind of running into that from from the microphones that we were using to track this band, and then that all went into a pretty old computer. It was amazing what it could do, you know, for just a you know it was probably like a two gigabyte of RAM, you know, smaller hard drive, two thousand four, five, six era PC computer. No, I probably wouldn't even need that much, right? Just something about that time. But that's what we used. Yeah, that's like all we had. All we had with us. We had a, I think it was like a PreSonus um, audio interface, and then we got like like an eight channel audio interface. That was really cool. You know, we had like eight eight digital audio channels coming into the the interface, which means we could track eight live channels into sonar at a time, and uh, it didn't even hiccup. You know, even on that old machine. And so uh, it was interesting how that, that architecture worked to do some editing stuff, but. Uh, uh, sonar is what I had been using before uh, for some stuff. Really, Audition, Adobe Audition is what I'd used most for some of this kind of the more simple uh, radio broadcast style stuff. And that's what I had learned to use when I was at um, when I was at a radio station doing an internship years and years ago, back in two thousand eight, right? Summer of two thousand eight, I did that, and they used Adobe Audition version one point five to uh, to do all of their uh, radio production edits and uh, yeah, I remember I remember going in taking calls with the, the production guy. I don't know somebody calling in to do like a I think they would do like a water level report. It was really interesting radio on that station. You know, you could figure, but uh, they would have like this. Uh, I don't know something like you know it's it's twelve forty five and here's your local water level report for July twenty eighth or something, and then it would be some lady that would call in. Um, from a department that would measure this stuff and she would give her water report and the production guy you'd record it and then produce that and then it'd be prepped to go out on air later you know it was like a spot that uh, a dj would trigger upstairs and so we would kind of walk through using audition to do those steps and so learning that as a program was probably the first one that i had done um 
which I don't know, probably goes back to high school or before that when I was doing editing stuff. But but sonar, um, back to sonar was uh, some of the stuff that I'd used probably a good bit more for the um, for the music, you know, like trying to like track a band or do like multi-tracking projects. But uh, um, so, yeah, that's what I'd used a bit. That's why I'd thrown on this Windows 10 PC to do some audio production stuff for this podcast workflow that I was uh, trying to get into. And uh, it's cool. It works really well. But uh, but I stopped using that computer a while ago. I think the uh, the, the Windows 10 computer that I'm talking about had uh, a power supply go bad, which could be replaced pretty easily and, and uh, is on a to-do list of mine. But since then, I've really just been relying on, kind of like I had mentioned, um, just recording recording onto the device and then uh, using Adobe Audition to do the uh, post-production work on my MacBook, which uh, is, I don't know, it's just a, it's just a more... It's just a better workflow and stuff for the, for the most part. So I've been kind of sticking with that. But recently, to get to the point, as you are all excited, uh, Logic Pro 10.5 has come out. Now, Logic, as yet to be mentioned in this podcast, Logic Pro is the program that was produced by Apple as their professional digital audio workstation. And so there's GarageBand, which probably a lot of people have some experience with. And GarageBand is sort of the trimmed down, simplified um, home user version of a program like like Logic Pro. And and they've done that intentionally. I think it's the same team that generates the two programs. And if you if you look at them or you look at their interfaces and you look at their the the types of access that you have to things, you you really do see a, a familiar similarity to it. Which is cool. Um, so if you've used something like GarageBand in the past for home projects, you, you won't really have as big of a, a, a difficulty moving into a more professional digital audio workstation environment like Logic Pro 10. So I think it was Logic Pro 10, just, you know, 10 zero that came out, well, I don't know, probably like 2013 or so. And I think that was uh, that was sold for 200 bucks. So it was like a, a purchase price of 199 And then since then, you get the point updates for free um, or, you know, as included with your original purchase. Uh, so just recently, I, th- I think there had been like 10.4 before this, and then now they've moved on to 10.5. And 10.5, I think, is probably the biggest, uh, as noted by you know plenty of news sources, um, as noted as, uh, as one of the most significant uh, feature updates that Logic has had probably in, in years and years. I mean, I think this is the first time that they've gone through and removed and updated some of those legacy items that have been in there since, I don't know, 2003 or four or five, you know, it was just some of these legacy products that were, um, that were originally put in there, including their interfaces too. It looks like a 2002 interface for, uh, for, you know, like there's these synthesizer interfaces where there's these weird knobs that you have to, these weird just rotating features of the interface. It looks like, it looks ridiculous. I don't know other, any other way to explain it, <laughs> but it's a, uh, it's pretty wild for some of the some of the stuff that's just remained in computer uh, computer systems for a long time. But for ten point five, they try to go through and update a lot of that stuff, um, and it's really uh, interesting. There's a lot of cool new features in Logic ten point five. So Logic is real similar to Sonar, which is I guess kind of why I mentioned it. And at least through my experience, it's similar. You guys would probably think it's similar to. I don't know what people that are listening probably actually have some. Well, <laughs> no one's listening. What am I saying? Um, if someone were to bother to try and find some information out about logic and they ended up listening to this podcast, they'd probably have had some information about it or they would be coming from uh, from an experience with uh, Avid's Pro Tools. And uh, Pro Tools is like the industry standard for multi tracking DAW software. And I've never used it, I've never opened Pro Tools, I've never seen. Pro Tools, you know, in in its process at all. Um, I've, I don't know. I've, I've looked at a couple of videos or something, but yeah, I have no I have no experience working in Pro Tools, um, and I don't know. I'm not a fan of, of Avid's software overall. You know, for Pro Tools uh, or for uh, or for the Avid system of uh, of video editing stuff either. I'm just I'm not I'm not really. Uh, that interested in the, t- the kind of stuff that they put together, um, and it, really for price and stuff too. It just seems kind of kind of over overdone a little bit. So uh, so I'm pretty happy with uh, with some of the other the other more available tools that are in the consumer computer market. I mean, I think it's like 800 bucks or something still to get 
uh, to get Avid's Pro Tools. And I think that in the past, it was just, you know, insanely more than that, even, you know, kind of proprietary. Back in the past, it was more difficult. Now, I think M Audio is a partner with Pro Tools. And so uh, in the past, if you have Pro Tools, you have a lot of proprietary Pro Tools audio interfaces that you had to use um, if you wanted to set up your studio to work seamlessly with the Pro Tools uh, software. Um, now I think they've made a deal with M Audio, which is um, sort of like a, a less expensive audio interface manufacturer. They've had like uh, interfaces and microphones and, uh, you know, they, they've got like an array of, I think they've got like some studio monitors, they've got some interfaces, they've got uh, like keyboards is a big one that they've got. I've got a keyboard over here from M Audio. And what is it? Yeah, M Audio. They're less expensive. They make Pro Tools uh, interfaces, which is cool uh, now, so that they've got a partnership with Pro Tools. And I think that they've been trying to make that more accessible to musicians, probably because it's become a more competitive market with, um, well, really with like Logic, Logic Pro. I think I think the industry standard stuff is, uh, I don't know, it always seems like more secure than it should be. Or, you know, it doesn't it doesn't seem like an absolute that Pro Tools should be the uh, the digital audio workstation of of engineers across the world, but for whatever reason, it's just kind of taken over. And, and as those people, you know, are still still in those positions, I think that's uh, that's just what's taught in audio recording school as like a standard. Uh, even though there's a lot of other good other good services and choices out there, I think I've seen Sonar and Logic taught a lot too. So I don't know, they're they're definitely competitive. And, and as I've been hearing more. There's, there's, I don't know. There's produce, you know, music producers that are coming out saying, "Oh yeah, I do a lot of a lot of my work in in Logic." And and there's, you know, there's a whole class of music producers that are Logic-based producers or Sonar-based producers, or I don't know. It seems to kind of rotate around every couple of years for for who's doing what or you know, who wants to look cool. People that use Pro Tools want to look cool probably a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> so back to. Back to old uh, Logic Pro 10.5. Here's the good stuff. So Logic Pro 10.5 introduces live loops. This is probably one of the bigger feature updates that's been seen in Logic or in an integrated digital audio workstation in years, probably probably in like 20 years or something. I don't know. It's, it's all seemed to be about the same where you just have you just have a multi-track environment that's like a linear starts from zero time and then ends at the end of your project, to, you know, to infinity, let's suggest, but, you know, to your your multiple minutes. Um, and then in this, you have that multi-track view where you're just kind of layering and stacking these different sections so that they're they're coming together. And so you can kind of visualize how those sounds are coming together. Um, I think now, in opposition to that, there was programs like Ableton, which had non-linear audio production development. Um, and that's kind of complicated to say, but I think it was uh, a different way of visualizing the interface so that you could trigger loops in time in a measure or in a bar, and those would trigger appropriately in that measure. And then when you had that, that set up of you know, a couple loops that would cycle through, you could trigger those on and off, and you could kind of create, create changes to whatever that, that sound was, and then you could record that or, or send that out. Um, that's kind of, I don't know, that's, a, that's an incomplete way of explaining Ableton. But the idea in Logic Pro 10 here is uh, they're kind of merging those two environments so you have them both available to you in your digital audio workstation space, workstation space at any time. And so uh, the live loops uh, representation that we get in Logic Pro 10 is this grid of uh, kind of chiclet style buttons that you've become accustomed to seeing on an iPhone or something like that. But you have this grid of buttons and then in that uh, you can drop drop in loops that you have so these real instrument loops uh, and the loop library that you have you can bring those over and set those up in in track locations but you just have this block there and then next to that you can grab a different loop or a similar loop and then drag that into the second block and so what happens is that if you were to tap or click on that loop you get a play button and it would play that one loop all the way through uh, to the you know to the end of the loop, and then if you were to trigger that stem of loops vertically, it would play all of the loops that you would set up in that vertical column at the same time to play in time with each other, and then it would create um, it would create a mix of music. It's pretty cool. It's a really nice and fast way to kind of demo out ideas, and all this time you're not recording these ideas necessarily. You're just kind of playing them live, starting and stopping them live. And then trying to come up with um, with sort of the the mixed performance of how you'd want these stems to come together in a final production, and so it's really cool. You can have your your drum track in there, 
where you can have a couple different variations of a drum track if you want to go between a different a different beat or a different uh, velocity of rhythm during the chorus section to the verse section to the bridge you can kind of break those pieces up uh, similarly like if you go down next to like your bass loops you could have a, you know a bass line that was started in the intro and then change during the first verse and then become you know, I don't know some simplified refrain during the chorus and then kind of change out again for the for the rest of it along with the lead along with you know whatever else or whatever other textures you want to add into your tracking you can kind of have those laid out in these uh, in these kind of square pads like a drum pad sort of a thing and then as you trigger those sounds or you can trigger horizontally too if you want um, the idea is you kind of organize stems of things vertically that you can trigger so you can go to those live but if you want to mix that up you can shut everything off and then play those loops individually as they'll play with each other to make new sounds and so you can be really creative and do a lot of a lot of interesting things i think i think it's been pretty cool uh, learning about what i did uh, for training stuff is uh, so right now Apple has, um, I think I was mentioned earlier, the the Logic Pro 10.5 uh, system so- or the software is uh, I think $199 to purchase. Uh, if you purchase Logic Pro 10, you get this update included uh, at no cost, which is really cool. But if you have yet to purchase Logic and you're interested in trying out or or trying to learn some stuff about uh, about this digital audio workstation versus others or, or you know whatever it might be. They've got a 90-day free trial going on right now, so you can go to, uh, you can go, get this, and then try it for the next 90 days in full service and see if you like it. And so, uh, it's definitely worth it in that capacity. I think that's kind of cool. What's also cool is there are 70 gigabytes of sounds that you can get in a sound library to attach to your Logic Pro 10.5. Uh, software and so with this they're all royalty free all available to use uh, loops and midi instruments and sampled instruments that you're uh, you have access to create music with so it's really cool and it's really so much music and sound and all you know and all these loops contained that you have a, a ton of creative options available to you and right there and that's what's cool is you get so you don't really start off with a, a dearth of an experience once you just get this audio software. It comes with 70 gigabytes of, of, of instruments of everything for, you know, bass, electric drums, organic drums, um, like any kind of percussive interest, instrument, any kind of synthetic uh, or any kind of synthesizer sound that you want to try and get, you can achieve with it. It's really cool. Um, so, yeah, you can take those and, uh, and throw it in. Uh, you can do the 70 gigabyte download of data and throw that onto an external hard drive now, which is pretty cool. I think for a long time they just had this integrated database where everything had to sit on your main drive. And I think that drove drove a lot of music producers crazy as they tried to have, um, you know, bigger libraries of of loops and stuff. But it's probably in part because hard drives weren't weren't fast enough back in the day for that sort of stuff. But now, you know, in the last many years since uh, like Final Cut has had had video libraries on external drives it seems like they should have made the capacity for for logic to have um have your loop library on an external drive a little easier so i wanted to talk about the training stuff that i've been doing i think i'd mentioned i had mentioned i had done a good bit of work with uh you know other programs in the past but this is really the first time that i've gotten into uh spending time learning specifically about some of the 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 features and the controls in Logic Pro uh, and now Logic Pro 10.5. Um, so what I've done is uh, gone to now what's called LinkedIn Learning. LinkedInLearning.com, huh? Um, there, there used to be a website called Lynda.com, and Lynda.com was these uh, these screencast uh, video tutorials of how to use different types of software and, and how, how to be trained, you know, just training for, for different types of um, of most of the time, computer-related skills. Uh, so I've used that service for um, a number of things over the years. Uh, specifically, I think Chris Orwig's Lightroom tutorial is probably like a standard for a lot of photographers that have been interested in uh, in learning about photography editing. And so all of those courses that have existed over the years uh, have a lot of a lot of good information in them. Um, but so I went back to uh, to what would be Lynda.com now, as it has been purchased by LinkedIn. Uh, through Microsoft, it's now called uh, LinkedIn Learning. Right on, huh? 
Uh, so LinkedIn Learning has all of the old Linda videos, including all the updates to the videos that they're still continuing to produce. Uh, so I went on and I, I tried to find some training videos about Logic Pro 10. Uh, there's a number of videos uh, for like essential training for Logic Pro 10, but there's nothing because now this new update, Logic Pro 10.5, is really only maybe two weeks old or something. Uh, it's uh, there's no there's just no new video training established for it. So I think for Logic Pro 10.4, there's a full essential training video that was produced by. Uh, was it Scott Hirsch, a music producer out of New York, and uh, he just kind of goes through uh, the the controls and the the system and stuff, and you get you get a good feel of uh, like how to how to make changes, how to use different features, how to use the mixer versus uh, like the linear tracking system, you know how to use different controls and stuff. A lot of the stuff is is similar if you've used GarageBand, like I was mentioning, or another digital audio workstation that does multi tracking in the past. Uh, but it was cool, yeah, learning like some techniques about how to apply uh, different different compress or how to make the settings of a compressor do more specifically the types of things that I'm wanting to do in a mix. Uh, I think was some good information for me to be learning about through the uh, the Logic Pro uh, training stuff. Also, in addition to that, if you don't, the, so LinkedIn Learning is a paid service. You can get a, a one month of free trial of that too, which. Uh, I'm taking advantage of at this moment to get uh, to get some new information in. But what you can do is go to YouTube and look up similar uh, similar training videos. And there's a lot of people, a lot of music producers out there that have done their own screencasts of kind of walking through different services or different techniques that these digital audio workstations provide. So I was, I was looking at a guy. Uh, guy's website, I think it was whylogicprorules.com and that had a lot of good training videos on it too. Uh, he had a lot of information about how different pieces of it work and uh, just how to how to make use of a lot of the techniques that you'd have to apply in a certain piece of the software to make it more effective. And I thought that was really cool. I, I really appreciated some of the stuff that he'd done and uh, because he's a YouTube channel, he's just kind of putting out content more regularly. So he has, I think, five videos up right now about these different features related to Logic Pro 10.5. Um, so I think it's like a general overview. There's one specifically about the Live Loops feature that I was mentioning is, uh, is one of those premier new, uh, new interface features that's now part of Logic Pro 10.5. In addition to that, I think they've created a step sequencer, a new sampler. I think they have a, a quick sampler now, and they have a, a full sampler where you can go through and make your own samples to make your own loops uh, so you can really be producing your own music. And, uh, and I think that's I think it's really cool, the kind of stuff that you can do. That's a big update that they've done. I think they, they talk about, like, what is the ES, ESX24, 27, something like that. It was this old sampler, this old uh, sampler software that was... Probably some third-party pr plugin that ended up being bought and then ended up being integrated into Logic. That's speculation. But the way that it looks, it just doesn't look like Apple had ever designed it. Uh, <laughs> so it's like it's this crazy-looking kind of silver software with a ton of buttons and knobs and stuff. It looks like it was supposed to be some some real object, you know, like a, like if they made some some actual pedal board. You know, it looks like a drum machine or something. Uh, but it's laid out in as a software in front of you, and it's just impossible, it seems to me, to use. So uh, so Apple's gone through and updated that uh, that kind of legacy piece. Uh, some people are happy about it. Some people are mad about it. I see some people writing in forums, long live the ESX sampler. And then everybody, or plenty of people saying they're, they're happy to see it go and that they're happy to see it uh, replaced by a more modern piece of uh, a more modern utility. So there's a lot of cool features in that stuff too, where you can you can really get into recording and making your own samples, or, or taking a piece of music that you've already recorded, and having the sampler go through and auto select these regions of it, so you can go through with your, like your keyboard and you can trigger those regions with your keyboard to play that to play that sound out. It's it's really fascinating the kind of sampling that you can do with it. Uh, Gosh, I mean, there's just so much production you can do with it. So uh, as it goes for podcasting, hmm, I wonder if I'm going to use Logic. I think I think Logic, well, you know, and really honestly, like most of the audio production stuff that I would do, even to a small degree, which I mean, honest, honest God, it's really nothing. I could do this on my phone. Or not, not that, you know, my phone is great, but just I'm not doing anything, right? So, uh, so I might, I, you know, I stopped using Sonar because it was kind of overkill to do the multi-tracking stuff. 
uh, for, for just a podcast for some audio or mastering stuff. It seems like, uh, I have a grip of how to do the editing in logic, maybe a little better than I do in audition, even though I've been using audition for years. Uh, I kind of have the same, the same process and stuff, but there's, there's sort of a way that uh, this is something I, I don't understand yet. And if someone that actually understands logic has listened to, to any of this, they should tell me about it. But, uh, it seems like in audition, when you have an audio file, like a wave loaded into the program and you're looking at it and editing it, editing it, if you were to apply, say, an EQ effect or a compressor, once you have those settings and then you apply it, it'll render that change to the wave and you have to wait for it. You have to wait like 20 seconds when you apply when you apply an effect, like a hard limiter or a compressor or a de and it'll change the full waveform that you're seeing there. In, in Logic, it seems... I guess more like a non-destructive editor where you have your original waveform in your track and then over in the mixer you can apply uh, sends or you can apply these effects as a stack that you can turn on and off and it'll it'll kind of live mix that section of audio that you're hearing and so you can you can stack on a compressor first change those settings and stack on an EQ and then stack on a de-esser and then stack on a limiter or something at the end of that or a, a limiter on your, your master output, something. I don't know. I think that's how you're supposed to do it. So you can do that, and then you can change those settings, and you're not really adapting the original waveform. You're not, doing, you're not doing that in a stage where if, if you turn one on or one off, that you're, you're kind of rendering the whole file in advance. I don't know if I have that totally right, but that's something I'm trying to figure out. So some things that you notice from that is audition or programs that kind of bake in the setting effect that you're you're making a change to seem to operate a lot faster i think because the track is sort of is sort of rendered and frozen and it's not have, the process is not having to do any live rendering of of added effects on top of the file that's already trying to have to have to grab that file and then play that file and then add another layer of digital processing to it that you selected through changing settings and then render those settings to the wave file as it plays it without much latency. Man, it just sounds like a, a lot of task to do. So I guess when you have like a, a bigger logic project with 24 instrument tracks, all with compressors and limiters and, and whatever other effects uh, changes there are on it, uh, I, apparently it's just really processor intensive. And it, it, I don't know, I've already noticed like even just with a few of the smaller demo projects that they have installed with it, and even with my computer being okay, it's uh, it's already like hit like a CPU overload a few times, and Logic, Logic producers have talked about this a ton of times. There's a bunch of videos out there on uh, like how to stop your CPU overload messages. Some of it's talking about changing your buffer size. Some of it's talking about selecting tracks and freezing them. Uh, or uh, there's a process called freezing a track, sort of similar to what we just talked about with Audition, where you're you're kind of baking in or rendering that track out so that the processor doesn't have to worry about it anymore. And then from there on, uh, you, you can just kind of mix on the single track that you're you're working on at that time. If you're working on a multi-track project, you select the I don't know, it's like the guitar, but then you can freeze all the drums so that whatever mix that they whatever mix state they were in, the computer doesn't have to worry about processing. It'll only worry about processing the live effects on that single guitar track in the sense that you're 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 making changes to. It's cool. Um, I don't know. There's a few different features and stuff you can do to it. And it's interesting how all of these, uh, these different digital audio workstation controls have come up over the years. I think, like, for this Logic stuff, you know, this is what they're trying to sell Mac Pros for. I'm sure, like, even a Mac Mini would be a killer uh, Logic workstation for a studio. But, uh, but yeah, they like that new Mac Pro, that gnarly one with, you know, 128 cores. I think one of the things they were, they were trying to demonstrate with that is, you know, with the... Uh, with a massive, a massive amount of core, and what is it? Probably like eight or twelve or something for the more standard one. I think that, or the whole background of getting you know a ton of RAM and a ton of processor space and a ton of cores was uh, to do some of these larger studio mixes of Logic projects. You know, say if you have a symphony or you have like a full orchestra or something that you're trying to do a mix of, you have these live effects and compressors running on every track and you could have up to, you know, a hundred or a thousand tracks or something running with these live, uh, these live effects that have to be processed on it. And so the idea was, and I, I've heard this at other times that, uh, that larger studios would take, would take Mac pros and run them in tandem 
so that they would have as many tracks as that individual Mac Pro could have, and then that would be bust down. <laughs> that would be bust down into another mixer where they would have all of those. Is that making sense? Yeah, they would have, let's say, like, uh, I don't know, let's say 100 tracks would be on Mac Pro 1, and then they would have 300 tracks in total, so they would have Mac Pro 2 and 3, and each of those would have 100 tracks that it was responsible for operating in Logic, and then it would run in tandem and then be mixed out to a bus so that you would have all of those tracks rendered down into the 300 onto their their channels. I don't know. It's it's crazy stuff, but it's it's kind of this like reduction process. They don't need to do that anymore apparently because the I don't know, is what they're trying to sell, you know. These uh the, the newer Mac Pros or if you max out a computer to its fullest, you you can kind of handle some of these larger processor intensive uh, projects like that. In response to that, man, I remember in 2003 using Cool Edit Pro to do 24 track multi-track projects on a computer with 800 megahertz and i didn't really have a problem with it so i'm not really quite sure what i'm understanding about logic or about audio production stuff in that in that capacity it seems like there's some other some other tools or other utilities around uh not tools but uh just some other concepts right that uh, that allow you to do stuff without some of the limit i don't know some of the processor limitations that's always kind of frustrating when the technology kind of gets in there to fight with you. But, uh, but I'm sure that the intent of it is that you do more live processing. That means you have to, you have to do less, uh, rendering time on each individual track. And man, the mixing process can be really frustrating if you have to render out a million different variations of changes, which is kind of different projects that I've gotten stuck in over the years. So man, I don't know. We'll see how it goes, but, uh, it's cool. Yeah. I've been trying out logic pro 10.5 in the, the studio staff learning some keyboard controls, learning how to run some live loops, been trying to mess around with some different mixes and stuff. It's cool. Yeah, you can just grab those loops, throw them in. I can make a, uh, what I've been trying to do is make like a drum bass and sort of texture sound loop that kind of has a couple changes in it. And then I can take a guitar, plug it into the audio interface, set effects that are built into Logic. You can pull up like a pedal board in Logic and then have that adapt the sound of your incoming real instrument and then run that into a track or even just play live into a track and then have those live loops kind of running on the side of it. So you can kind of create like a, you know, like a jam loop or something, you know, you don't have a band to play with. So you can kind of create a couple other instruments that have pieces and then that are in a key that are going to repeat. And then you can kind of find whatever it is in the guitar that, that you want to to kind of work out an idea or, or work on you know, playing through something. So it's kind of cool. I've been trying that out a bit too. And then uh, once you do have an idea, it's really easy to just kind of lay that down into a track and create a demo out of it. So it's really fun. Uh, Logic Pro 10.5. You guys got to check it out. Thanks a lot for listening to this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. I'll probably be wrapping it up here today. Got to drink my coffee. I made a full coffee and I haven't even really sipped on it. Now it's only lukewarm. Shoot. So what am I going to do? I think I'm going to go from here. I'm going to suggest that you guys go to BillyNewmanPhoto.com and uh, check out the support page. I've been uh, trying, that, trying that out. So BillyNewmanPhoto.com forward slash support. You'll find something similar to the layout of a Patreon page there where you could, if you found value in uh, some of the, the podcast information that I put out or some of the website stuff, some of the photo stuff that I've done, uh, you can throw a couple bucks my way. Uh, to whatever degree of value you found in it. Um, if you found value in it, provide it. That'd be great. I'd always appreciate it. And uh, you can do that at com forward slash support. What else is there? Probably some new stuff on the blog, some new, uh, new website stuff. Man, I don't know. Probably back to doing some Logic Pro 10.5 stuff. I need to go on a drive. I'm, I'm, um, I'm kind of itching to go out toward somewhere, somewhere out toward the coast is what I'd like to do, but... I don't know, really, I want to get out toward Eastern Oregon again. It's May now. Like, late May. Like, Memorial Day was yesterday. Man. Time is different. 2020, what a year. Pretty cool stuff. Well, I'll uh, try and check in again on another podcast coming up soon. Send me some feedback if you want. If you've made it all the way to this part of the podcast, uh, shoot me a message through the contact form on my website. Always appreciated to hear that, uh, that someone has, uh, has bothered to check out this podcast and until next time my name is billy newman thanks a lot for listening bye